clearly set out the illegality of any measures tantamount to de facto annexation and underline the clear continued legal obligation of the occupying power as regards protected persons in the territory occupied since 1967. In the case that the court reaches the conclusion that the situation in the occupied Palestinian territories must be seen as tantamount to de facto annexation, the next question is, what would be the legal consequences for Israel? In the 1971 Namibia opinion, this court referred to an obligation on the part of the occupant to withdraw its administration of the territory immediately or as rapidly as possible. Analogous conclusions were drawn by the court in the Chagas opinion. Furthermore, the Security Council in Resolution 476 of 1980 reaffirmed the overriding necessity for ending the prolonged occupation. Mr. President, in the Namibia opinion, the court was mindful of the fundamental consideration that it should not make any determination that would result in adversely affecting the population of the territory in question. This principle is codified in Article 47 of the Fourth Geneva Convention as a cardinal safeguard. The provision clearly expresses the general principle that the Fourth Geneva Convention protects civilians regardless of the status of the territory in question. Moreover, the formal characterization of the occupied territory cannot relieve the occupying power of the obligation it owes to the population of that territory. Clear legal obligations incumbent on Israel include access of humanitarian actors to the occupied Palestinian territory, including the Gaza Strip. In Resolution 2720 of 2023, the Security Council reiterated its demand that all parties to the conflict, including Israel, comply with their obligations, including with regard to humanitarian access and the protection of humanitarian personnel and their freedom of movement. I thank you for your attention. I will now ask Ambassador Rolf Einar Fifa to come to the podium. I thank Mr. Jarvel. I now give the floor to Mr. Fifa. You have the floor, sir. Mr. President, <clears throat> distinguished members of the court, it is an honor for me to appear again before this court on behalf of the Kingdom of Norway. Uh, for completeness, I will now address certain elements which Norway considers to be part of the legal framework applicable to the occupied Palestinian territory. They constitute, in our view, solid foundations under international law for the two-state solution to which Norway is fully committed. Mr. President, I would like to start by noting the statement before this court on the 12th of January by the co-agent of Israel in a contentious case when he recalled, and I quote, the commitments made at the time the state was established as reflected in our Declaration of Independence, end of quote. This reminder of the commitments made in the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel on the 14th of May 1948 is indeed important. The Declaration is a key constitutive document for the establishment of the State of Israel. It is based on the strength of Resolution 181 of 1947 of the UN General Assembly concerning the plan of partition with economic union. It is indeed rare to find similar constitutional documents that are explicitly based on a specific United Nations resolution, as was done here. The declaration added that the State of Israel was, and I quote, prepared to cooperate with the agencies and representatives of the United Nations in implementing the resolution, end of quote. Furthermore, the resolution was considered in the Declaration to constitute an irrevocable recognition by the United Nations of the right to establish a state. This ought to imply that the same applies to the Palestinian side. 
an international legal framework has since been built in a figurative sense, brick by brick, under the auspices of the United Nations, with a view to achieving a two-state solution. And a point of departure here are the commitments made at the time the State of Israel was established and their subsequent legal relevance. On the 15th of May 1948, the Foreign Minister of the Provisional Government of Israel, Mr. Moshe Sharet, transmitted the contents of the Declaration of Independence to the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Trig Li. On the day independence was declared, Arab neighboring states attacked Israel. On the 16th of November that year, the Security Council demanded in Resolution 62 the establishment of an armistice in all sectors of Palestine. The armistice demarcation lines later established and since referred to as the Green Line were without prejudice to future territorial settlements or boundary lines. On the 29th of November that same year, Foreign Minister Charette sent a formal application for membership in the United Nations to the Secretary General. The letter stated that independence had been proclaimed, and I quote, in pursuance of Resolution 181 of the General Assembly. It added that Israel unreservedly accepts the obligations of the United Nations Charter and undertakes to honor them from the day when it becomes a member of the United Nations." End of quote. Mr. President, the subsequent decision-making process concerning UN membership in accordance with Article 4 of the Charter is significant. Pursuant to Article 22 of the Covenant for the League of Nations, and the adoption of Class A mandate, Palestine had been provisionally recognized in 1922 as an independent nation, subject to the rendering of administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory, until such time as it was able to stand alone. By virtue of Article 80 of the Charter, rights of self-determination rights of self determination were not altered in 1945. They were continued. The announced notice of determination of the Palestine mandate by the United Kingdom in 1947 provided the background for the adoption of Resolution 181, already referred to. Norway voted in favor of that resolution. The two-state solution formed the context of the vote on admission of Israel to UN membership. On the 4th of March 1949, as a member of the Security Council, Norway voted in favor of such admission, stating in its explanation of vote that it was, and I quote, confident that Israel will cooperate fully and loyally with all decisions by organs of the United Nations." End of quote. Subsequently, on the 11th of May that same year, Norway also voted in favor of Resolution 273 on admission in the General Assembly. This decisive resolution referred to Resolution 181 of 1947, but also to, and I quote, the declarations and explanations made by the representatives of the government of Israel before the ad hoc political committee in respect to the implementation of the said resolutions." End of quote. Indeed, from the 5th to the 9th of May 1949, Israel's representative in that committee, Mr. Abba Eban, had fielded questions from member states. His assurances became an integral part of assessments made by the relevant UN organs as regards membership. For instance, on the 5th of May, Mr. Eban recalled that Resolution 181 recommended that when either state envisaged by that resolution had made its independence effective, end of quote, sympathetic consideration should be given to membership in the UN. 
He added that, and I quote, the time had come for the UN if it wished Israel to bear the heavy burden of charter obligations to confer upon Israel the protection and status of the charter, end of quote. After the decisive vote in the General Assembly, Foreign Minister Sharet stated that the aftermath of the war had changed some elements in the patterns, pattern envisaged in the 1947. <تصفيق> أهلنا في فلسطين محتاجيننا نقف جنبهم كتف في كتف في الوقت ده وعشان كده مؤسسة حياة كريمة هتساهم في دعم أهلنا في فلسطين بكل المساعدات الطبية والغذائية الممكنة شاركنا في دعم ومساندة أهالي فلسطين من خلال التبرع على الحسابات التالية كتفنا في كتف أهلنا في فلسطين